everyone knows the blue whale is the biggest and heaviest animal to ever live, right? There were plenty of contenders throughout Earth history, but none have ever been able to be definitively proven as precisely the same weight, mass, or size. That was, of course, until a brand new, bulky-boned whale was pulled out of the coastal rocks of Peru's Ica Desert. Let's meet Perusitas. Much to the pseudoscientific creationists' dismay, pretty much every single fossil organism is an example of a transitional form in evolutionary history. This is because the chances are extremely high that the individual found in the fossil record is but a branch along an evolutionary journey from the beginning of life to today. Though life never ceases to evolve and everything around us today adapts in real time, we don't see them evolve into entirely different forms as one might think we see in the fossil record or one might ignorantly think of the process of evolution. The reality of the situation is that organisms generally evolve very slowly over time via the process of natural selection. Only a few of those organisms died in the right circumstances to become fossilized, so each one is technically their own transitional form. Even with animals that have lots of specimens to their species name, like Tyrannosaurus rex, it is difficult to parse them as forms that morph into other forms over periods of time. However, one of the best, most diverse, and obvious examples of an evolutionary transition in life habits is that of the whales, the cetaceans. This evolutionary transition saw a group of tetrapods evolve to go back into the water 300 million years after they had left to gain access to terrestrial resources. The earliest known mammals to split away from the others to become the whales were chevrotain-like members of the even-toed ungulate clade Artiodactyla. These were forms like Indohyus and the Pachycetids, all the way back in the early to mid-Eocene epoch, 56 to 40 million years ago. Whales quickly diverged into more aquatic adapted forms and ballooned in size during the global greenhouse of the Eocene, with the late Eocene seeing far more familiar and larger forms such as the Bacillosaurus. True cetacean gigantism would not be seen till much later, with the largest animals to ever live evolving relatively recently with the blue whale. As animals acquire more aquatic habits, buoyancy becomes a critical aspect of their biology. You can't be too floaty if you want to get the good stuff, or you don't want to be too heavy if you just want to eat kelp at the beach. Out of all of the other tissues in the body, bone is the densest. Are you being intentionally dense? Huh? Which is probably why different tetrapod lineages have specifically adapted their bone mass differently and independently in a whole bunch of ways. A lot of the times, those critters that adapt to a shallow diving and slow swimming existence get more massive bones. This occurs by filling up the inside of the bones with compact bone rather than spongy bone, a condition called osteosclerosis. In extreme cases, some animals even evolve more deposits of bone on the outside surfaces of their bones, a condition called pachyostosis. Bone mass increase is documented in the many amphibious close relatives and ancestors of cetaceans, members of the Bacillosauridae specifically. Living whales are weird. They have developed an entirely different bone microanatomy. They have holes. They have osteoporotic bones typical of pelagic, secondarily aquatic tetrapods that are active swimmers. Therefore, the Bacillosaurids were unique in that they grew to immense sizes, up to about 20 meters, as well as large bone mass increases. The degree of their bone mass increase nevertheless did not match, up until now, that of some sirenians, or manatees and dugongs, for example, of which the whole rib cage is both strongly osteosclerotic and pachyostotic. They have 
absolutely enormous and thick and heavy ribs. They have the worst skeletons. A brand new study by a whole team of South American and European scientists in the journal Nature describes frustratingly fragmentary but mind-blowing remains of a super-large bacillosaurid whale from Peru. 13 years ago, paleontologist Mario Urbina made a colossal discovery on the southern coast of Peru. When seeing the first field photos, the rest of the team was puzzled because what cropped out of the ground was so freaking large and oddly shaped. Multiple field campaigns were necessary to collect what turned out to be parts of a colossal skeleton, given that each vertebra weighs well over 100 kilograms. The specimen specifically consists of 13 vertebrae, four ribs, and the right chunk of the vestigial pelvis. Based on cutting up some of the bone and attaching it to microscope slides and illuminating it under the scope, a practice called histology, the team of scientists were able to conclude that this individual was likely approaching skeletal maturity, so a young adult. This specimen comes from the upper part of the Yumake member of the Paracas Formation, exposed in the Ica Valley, a few kilometers south of the Zamaca locality, Ica Province, southern Peru. Using the techniques and science of biostratigraphy, which employs fossils as markers of time, plus argon dating of volcanogenic rock layers, the scientists were able to estimate the time of the layers from which the whale specimen came as the Bartonian section of the late Middle Eocene Epoch, well constrained between 39.8 to 37.84 million years ago. The team decided to name the animal Perocetus colossus, meaning simply Colossal Peruvian Whale. What makes this critter unusual, aside from the patently bizarre traits of the bones themselves, which I will get to here in a bit, is that it may just be the heaviest animal to ever live. Let's get one thing straight. The extreme bones of Perucetus are not due to disease, nor injury. Firstly, the bone mass increases part of the healthy aquatic adaptations of many tetrapods. It's common among the other bacillosaurids, and pachyosteosclerosis is even considered a defining trait of one of the subfamilies of the bacillosaurids, the pachycetinae. Remember that pachyosteosclerosis is the one-two punch of bones that are thick and dense at the same time. Dense? Huh? Just like me. Secondly, when some critter has a condition that causes it to grow extra bone on its bones, like acromegaly or osteopetrosis, excessive growth of certain body parts, and when the bones harden and become denser respectively, both the overall anatomy and alterations to the inner bone structure are highly variable, in just single bones or across the entire skeleton. The team knows the weird bones of Perucetus and her relatives are not the result of disease because all of the skeleton is affected. Pachyostosis, the thickening of bones, affects the entire Perucetus skeleton, being most obvious in the disgustingly bloated bits of the vertebrae that are not the central cylinder. These, therefore, are extremely messed up compared to the vast majority of known mammals. In fact, all living whales, even the biggest and baddest filter feeders, have what one might consider a normal, not disturbing backbone. They have tall, skinny struts and stuff, but they actually look like vertebrae. Perucetus's vertebrae look like the messed up Geiger-esque shells of some mollusks, the display butts of some primates, or even like, I don't know, a prehistoric fetish doll or something? Anyway. That pachyostosis I mentioned earlier helps to increase the volume of Perucetus's vertebrae. It's almost twice the volume of the largest vertebrae from the blue whale. The Perucetus ribs are also pachyostotic. The author team estimated a total skeletal volume 2.9 to 4.1 meters cubed. The team upscaled the relatively normal non-pachyostotic bones of the close relative Synthiocetus peruvianus and found that Perucetus had an excess of over 350% in volume. So, damn! So, how much did the thing weigh? 
Estimating body mass in bacilla swords is challenging. For Perusitis, methods based on simple skeletal measurements would also probably be biased by the fact that it has the weirdest and most unique skeleton of any known marine mammal. Furthermore, the excess of skeletal mass might have been compensated for by large amounts of blubber, which is less dense than most other soft tissues, which would therefore mess around with the animal's density. The author team examined the scaling of dry skeletal mass in a sample of mammals with known body masses. Compared with land mammals, whales have relatively lighter skeletons, with skeletal fraction values ranging from 2.2% to 5.1%. The skeletal fraction is the ratio of skeletal mass to total body mass. In land mammals, skeletal mass scales with positive allometry, and skeletal fraction ranges from 4% to 10%. The skeletal mass in amniotes spans nine orders of magnitude. The estimates range from 26 milligrams for the dwarf chameleon, Bruxia nana, to 9.9 .9 tons for the sauropod Argentinosaurus winculensis. The skeletal mass of living sirenians essentially scales as that of land mammals. These differences of scaling emphasize the two types of aquatic specialization described in living whales and sirenians, the osteoporotic-like condition and bone mass increase, respectively. However, these scaling relationships, which can be used to estimate body mass on the basis of skeletal mass, are indicative of the viable skeletal fraction values found in fully aquatic mammals. As for all other aquatic amniotes, the necessity of frequent surfacing to breathe prevents any strong deviation from neutral buoyancy. Given the two patterns observed for the skeletal fraction of fully aquatic mammals, the team used the extreme values measured in living sirenians and whales, assuming the mean skeletal fraction of adult manatees, which are the living marine mammals with the strongest bone mass increase, and the minimum skeletal volume estimation yields a body mass of 85 tons for Perocetus. That is absolutely massive. Using living whales' lowest skeletal fraction and the maximum skeletal volume yields an estimation of… 340 tons. With the mean of the skeletal mass estimates and the mean whale skeletal fraction 3.6%, an estimated body mass of 180 tons is obtained. These estimates fall within or far exceed the body mass distribution of the blue whale, therefore challenging the blue whale's title of heaviest animal that ever existed. 180 tons is right within the range of the blue whale, with the largest recorded weight of 199 tons, though they usually aren't found at this weight. However, that maximum possible weight of 340 tons is absolutely gobsmackingly off the charts, made even more bizarre by the fact that the estimated body length of Perusitis isn't as long as blue whales can get. Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a better idea of just how big this thing was. Its length is harder to say than its mass because of the unknown full proportions of the animal, but every reference I am finding is estimating a maximum as maybe slightly longer than 20 meters with a range of 17 to 20 meters, 55 to 65 feet, and of course that immense 85 to 340 ton range in weight. Thanks, Mr. Man. The amount of pachyosteosclerosis and perusitis is only seen in land animals that have adapted to life in the water. These super tiny pelvis and the dramatic size and weight of the beast means it wasn't going to land to pop out its kids. This tracks with literally every single member of its group, so it seems like an odd point for the author team to bring up, but uh, whatever. More relevantly, the extreme pachyosteosclerosis of the critter's bones is consistent with a shallow water lifestyle in which those weird bones would have helped the animal control its buoyancy, like with the living sirenians, the manatees and dugongs. This doesn't mean it was at the beach in the shallow water, but shallower parts of the ocean than most whales today, who travel across the deeper parts. 
Such a large and heavy animal may also have been able to counteract waves in high energy waters, as also hypothesized for the giant, recently extinct stellar sea cow. A coastal habitat has already been proposed for Bacillosaurids on the basis of stable isotopes and skeletal anatomy. So, what did the thing look like and how did the team reconstruct it and why? Drawing any specific conclusions on how the thing swam is hampered by the extremely fragmentary nature of the remains. The team have estimated that Perusetus would have swam by axial undulation, the whole body and tail up and down thing that manatees do, rather than the tail up and down thing that modern whales do. The thickness of the bones of Perusetus would have also restricted whole body movements meaning it would have only been able to swish its body and tail up and down in low arcs. This thing was getting nowhere fast. The bony struts that stick out of the backbones in Perusetus were super chunky and would have also made the animal stiff. A strong ventral flexion may have helped to push the heavy body of Perusetus upwards from the seafloor to breathe at the surface. Gigantism combined with the inferred undulatory swimming style of Perusetus and Bacillosaurus could represent an evolutionary adaptation analogous to that observed in Triassic ichthyosaurs. Indeed, in these marine reptiles, a giant size has been proposed to compensate for the relatively high energetic cost of undulatory locomotion. As the skull and teeth of Perusetus are unknown, any hypothesis about the diet and feeding strategy of this idiosyncratic early whale would be speculative. However, having hypothesized slow swimming speeds as well as benthic habits in shallow and agitated waters, and considering the huge quantity of food that would be needed to sustain such a giant animal, several observations may be made regarding the feeding style of Perusetus. Similar to Cyrenians, it may have fed on seagrass and or seaweed, but that would make it the sole herbivorous whale, a rather unlikely scenario. Alternatively, Perusetus may have fed on benthic, sedentary, or sessile fauna, for example, crustaceans, demersal fish, or mollusks. Suction and or filter feeding strategies to forage benthic fauna could also be speculatively evoked, in analogy with the trophic habits of the living grey whale. Finally, a further conjectural hypothesis is that Perusetus fed on low-cost, high-energy food sources by means of scavenging on the carcasses of sunken vertebrates, similar to many living large-bodied demersal sharks. Unfortunately, the sedimentological data and the scarce associated fauna do not provide useful information to better define the paleoecology of Perusetus its carcass having been probably transported to relatively deeper waters, although not too far away from the coast. All of this is why the author team decided to reconstruct the animal as overly deep, fat, small-headed, small-armed, and with a manatee-like tail fin, something that is entirely speculative until more of the skeleton is recovered. I somewhat hope it is this chunky because that would be hilarious, but something has my fossil sense tingling. I will defer to the author team as they're literally the ones that know more than any of us about this thing, but it will be interesting to see how it develops over time. What kind of world did this speculative and mysterious Perusetus live in? The Yumeke units of the Paracas formation from which Perusetus remains come are dated to the late Eocene. The Eocene was the hottest epoch during the Cenozoic era but also marked the decline into the ice house climate of the rest of the era, at the end of the Middle Eocene climatic optimum. Cooling and the carbon dioxide drawdown continued through the late Eocene and into the Eocene to Oligocene transition around 34 million years ago. Mammals were already the major land animals and had begun taking over the largest niches in the oceans as well. Obviously, giant birds and reptiles were still around, but not like they had been in the Paleocene. The specific layers from which Perusetus originates have not revealed as many fossil organisms as the layers above or below it, but they have revealed a bunch of other cetaceans that shared the waters with the behemoth, like other Bacillosaurids, Okukagia, and Supeacetus, the Anocetid, Mystacodon, and the possibly seal-like Protocetid, Peregocetus. The large penguin, Perudiptes, was swimming around catching fish. 
Paleoartist Hodari Nundu even imagined a hypothetical symbiosis between the swimming mountain Perusitis and Perudiptes colonies as a fun little speculative scenario. There are also fossils of Pristis, the sawfish. Obviously, there are plenty of other critters around at the time, but it would not have been much different from the rock layers directly above or below this one. Hopefully, more of this animal is found someday. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.